Hey United, it's Rachel, and I'm so glad to be gathering with you again online. I hope you're braving the heat well this week. Uh, before we get started, I'd love for you to each just take a second and check in. I know that we're several months into this whole online thing, but we just love hearing from you, hearing how you're doing, and if you want to share any prayer requests, we'd love to be praying for you as well. While you're filling out that check-in form, if you want to make a special note, we have Surfest coming up this coming Sunday. So we won't be gathering online like this, and we won't be gathering outside at Hannah Moore, but we'll be going out in our small groups into the community to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And so if you're not a part of a small group, uh, first of all, this is a great time to jump into one. Those are always open and we'd love for you to jump in uh, to community together. Um, but you can also email Leah at unitedchurchmd.org to get um, plugged in with a group that you can serve with just this coming Sunday. So again, um, if that's something that you haven't signed up for yet, we'd love for you to be a part of that and make a note on your check-in form. This is definitely an interesting time for our church as we're spread out, some of us gathering online, some of us gathering outside at Hannah Moore, some of us gathering online for Zoom groups and some of us gathering in person outside of people's houses. Um, but we just wanna make sure that we continue to be one and to pursue unity together. And so um, we have a message for you from some of our friends who have been gathering outside just to say, um, we miss you and we can't wait until we're able to see you again in person and gather together. So go ahead and check this out. Hey, what's up everybody? This is Travian and just wanted to say we miss you. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to come to Hannibal Park, uh, we look forward to seeing you here at Hannibal Park every Sunday at 10 o'clock a.m. this summer. Okay. Hey United Family, we miss you guys. Hope to see you soon. Hey guys, we miss you. We love you and we can't wait to see you again. Miss y'all. Come back and come by, come pick up your bags. We got we got here. We got the we got the yo-yo for y'all. Bubbles, I think, I believe. Bubbles, we got you guys some candy and some color for you guys' books. We miss you guys, come back please. Bring an umbrella. Hey guys, we miss you. Hope you're doing well. Hope to see you soon. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Our struggle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of the evil one in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the, all the Lord's people. 
Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Hey United, years ago I was at a marriage conference with my wife. If you've never been to a marriage conference before, just imagine hundreds of couples being together, you know, getting Starbucks lattes in the morning, sharing ice cream at night, whispering sweet nothings to each other in the session, frolicking through the hallways of a hotel and conference area, and that's a marriage conference. And it seems like everybody's marriage is perfect in these places, but the reality is we're at a marriage conference. Um, we need to grow and get help on how to, you know, be married and to love one another well as um, spouses. And so there are some people that are at these marriage conferences that they're doing great in their marriage. Uh, there's others that, you know, are struggling. Uh, and then some where maybe their marriage is hanging on for dear life uh, as they uh, try to get through this season of married life. Um, but we're at this marriage conference and in this setting, you know, there's a celebration of love and romance. We're singing songs about God's love. There's humor and there's fun and just people that are happy to be together. Uh, and then the, the moment comes in this conference where the speaker gets up um, and he starts to uh, share his message. And his opening line, I'm pretty sure it was his opening line, is marriage is war. Like, and he said marriage is war. It must have been like a hundred times in that talk that he said marriage is war. And he didn't say it like I just said it then. He said it with like this intensity, like marriage is war. Now, I don't know about you, but going to a marriage conference, I'm not thinking about war as something I want to emulate in my marriage. You know, like when we think about war, we think about whether it's hand-to-hand -hand combat or we might think about other things like, you know, bombs being dropped, guns being shot. You know, I love war movies particularly. And when I think about the war movies that I love, you know, there's a lot of blood and gory scenes in that. And, you know, so some of my favorite movies are um, Lone Survivor, Hacksaw Ridge, different, you know, war movies, Braveheart, Braveheart man, that is really gruesome. Uh, and that's a, it's a war movie. And so when I'm thinking here at a marriage conference and the speaker says marriage is war, it like zaps all of the fun and love and romance out of the room. And I start thinking about, oh my goodness, like what have we signed up for in this marriage conference? And the thing about what he said and what we later went on to learn is the war that he was thinking about was not necessarily the war that might come to our mind like I shared with war movies. Instead, he's thinking about um, a, a different kind of war. It's a war that's actually happening in our world today. Uh, we don't always uh, live aware of this kind of warfare, um, but America right now is under attack from other nations in this kind of dirty war where there's other nations that um, have these uh, the troll farms where they're just scrolling through the internet, social media, figuring out what kind could cause fear, division, hate, uh, anger, uh, and in disunity in our country, in our lives, in our relationships, and they're really good at it. And so on Facebook, there's a couple of different accounts that have been removed from Facebook because they figured out these weren't actually American citizens that had these Facebook accounts, like calling uh, one was called being patriotic, another was called progressive view, another was called blacktivism, and there were literally hundreds of thousands of followers who were Americans following these accounts made up from professional uh, from professionals in other countries that are just trying to get us angry at one another. And they do a great job. Even in Americans, we don't need help hating each other, but they do a better job of helping us hate one another even more in America. And, and so this is being revealed. This is the kind of warfare that's kind of happening right now. And I'm not sharing this as like some conspiracy theory. It's just the reality of the world where they can target you and me um, and they can, they can think about what time of day are we going to be emotionally, emotionally manipulated manipulated um, and and we could be targeted by these people and, and I'm not trying like stir any fear in you but when I think about this kind of warfare that's happening right now um, to our country and to you and I uh, this is nothing compared to to the spiritual war. Nothing compared to the war that is taking place spiritually. Now I know as soon as I say a spiritual war, some of you might have red flags going up. All right, 
weird, freaky. We're going to talk about a spiritual war. Um, and the reality is people who don't follow Jesus or don't believe in God will mock and make fun of people who believe in angels and demons. But if you read the Bible cover to cover, you're going to see lots of angels and demons. You're going to see the Bible talk about um, a supernatural war that is taking place that affects you and I in our everyday life. And so when the speaker said marriage is war, he wasn't talking about spouses being angry at each other. He was actually talking about a different kind of war. He was talking about the real enemy in marital conflict is Satan. The real enemy in our conflicts with each other, whether it's our families, whether it's our churches, whether it's in our workplace, our, our boss, or whatever committee we're a part of, or whatever team we're working on, it's not the people that we work with and that we live life with. The real war is a follower of Jesus is against Satan, and our, our enemy is him who is the enemy of Jesus. And so when we think about warfare, and we're going to talk about and end our Made for More series with talking about spiritual warfare, because that's how the book of Ephesians ends. It ends with talk, talking about a spiritual war, as we as a church talk about being made for more and wanting to move forward with the mission of God growing and the fullness of Jesus going to all the world. There is somebody that wants to stop that. And in fact, I believe he's doing a great job of stopping it right now. He's doing a great job through COVID having us argue about masks. He's having a great job uh, through the racial tensions having us argue and not have empathy or compassion or understanding. And all the fighting and division that's taking place, I think Satan is loving what is happening in 2020. And what we're going to talk about right now is, is not some concept of spiritual warfare that is weird or freaky, but it's actually incredibly practical. Like, I think you're going to be surprised by how practical it is. So if you get weirded out by this kind of stuff, stay with me because I think this is going to be incredibly helpful for us as we look at Ephesians 6 and how does Ephesians 6 help us live a made-for-more life, bringing the fullness of Jesus as we think about a real war that's taking place spiritually. So let's read Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. There you see it. There's the devil's schemes that people are being warned against. Verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So if you need to hit pause right now and reread that, feel free to reread it. Um, because that's being written to human beings, to people who are followers of Jesus Christ. And they're being told, your war right now in your marriage or in your workplace or in your church or whoever you're, you feel like you're in conflict with, it's not actually against them. Do you see that? Your war is not flesh and blood war, meaning people. Your war is a war against spiritual powers, authorities, rulers. That's exactly what it says. That's what Paul is writing to the Ephesians church about. And so as we wrap up this series um, and the fact that we're called to move the mission of Jesus forward, bring the fullness of Jesus um, to the world, we need to realize that we are spiritual beings doing a spiritual activity that has spiritual resistance. And so as we want to move forward, somebody wants us to move backwards. Um, there's an enemy who is, he's sneaky. It says his schemes. Um, so he's sneaky and tricky, and he's making you probably think right now, like, this is overly dramatic. Um, this teaching, I'm not going to deal with the spiritual warfare stuff. And he would love it if you believed that right now. Um, if, he, if you ignored this section of the Bible. Um, but that, this is true. Like, there's a spiritual war happening, and friends, like, we can't win this battle on our own. We need God. And in order for us to move forward with the fullness of God, we need God's help. We need his power. We need his strength. And so because there's spiritual forces at work, there are also God's spiritual forces at work for our good. And God gives us actually a couple of clear handles um, so to think about this war. And one of the first clear handles is to think about where this war is taking place. It's not a war that's like out there, that is in, you know, the heavenly realms. It's taking place outside of us. It's actually a war that's right here. It's in our mind. And if you don't believe me, let's go back to Genesis 1, because here's just two real easy points for us to grasp. And the first is this war is waged in your mind. 
That's where it's at. That's how simple and practical this message is going to be. It's not about reading a book about how like to fight spiritual warfare with certain types of prayers or certain types of activities and crazy weird things. It's just about acknowledging where is this war waged? First, it's in your mind. And so in Genesis, when we see the world created and there, Adam and Eve are living in a world that has no sin um, in the presence of no evil um, and enjoying one another and enjoying God's creation, the enemy shows up. He shows up disguised. And what does he do? He just says a couple of quick things there um, in Genesis in those, those first few chapters. And one is, did God really say that? And he's starting to stir up unbelief. Is God really who he said he is? Is God really good? Does God really love you? Is God really for you? He's, he's questioning and stirring up unbelief. The second thing he then says is, you're not going to die. If you sin, if you do what God told you not to do, you'll still be fine. Have you ever thought that way in your mind? You know what? God didn't put that thought in your mind and you didn't come up with it on your own. The enemy is actively putting these thoughts in our minds. He's the arch enemy of Jesus Christ, not wanting us to follow Jesus. And so he's always going to question the character of God, the goodness of God, and he's always going to question us and how we follow God. Another significant example, and if you see that example, it's all in the mind, right? The only way he is trying to get to Adam and Eve is by asking a question and telling a lie. He does nothing else in that story. And there's another story. It's the epic battle of Satan and Jesus. Um, and when you read this battle before it takes place, Jesus is baptized. He's being introduced into his ministry. And what's important to think about in that baptism is what does God say about Jesus? Because that's really important. When Jesus is brought out of the water, God says, this is my beloved son. I am pleased with him. Two huge things for the identity of Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are his son and his daughter because of Christ. And God's pleased with you because of Jesus. How often do you question if that's true? Who's making you question if that's true? Where is the spiritual war taking place? It's in the mind. Because what happens is when you see Jesus and Satan square off, Satan comes and says, if you're really the son of God, the first thing Satan does to try to stop Jesus from bringing the fullness of Christ and love and healing and hope and peace to the world is to question who he is. And every temptation, there's three temptations. We're not going to talk through all of them, but each one starts with, if you really are the son of God, he's questioning, he's getting Jesus. He's trying to mess with his mind the same way he messed with the minds of Adam and Eve. But thankfully, Jesus resisted that. He knew where the war was. It was in his mind, and he needed to think rightly about who God said he was. So when you think about, man, I'm a loser, nobody likes me, who do you think put that your th thought in your head? Do you think God says that about you, or do you think Satan says that about you? Um, or maybe when you think, you know, nobody at my church cares about me. Um, there might be a couple of reasons for that. Maybe you haven't showed up um, or reached out to anybody at church in six months, and it's not that they don't care about you. They just think you peaced out. Or maybe it's because the enemy wants you to think that way, to withdraw from people who are following Jesus, because he would love that if that happened. Or, or maybe you're thinking in this series, there's no way I can tell people about Jesus and share the love of Christ with other people. Like, I'm just an average Joe or an average person. And Satan loves it. He loves it when we think these ways. He's tricky and he's sneaky. And the author of these thoughts is Satan himself. And it's the only way this spiritual war is taking place in our lives. And it's right here in your head. It's not that complicated, friends. The spiritual warfare that a lot of people can get weird and freaky about, it's really not a weird thing. It's just the enemy trying to make us think wrong thoughts about God and ourselves and who we are because of Christ's love for us. So if you can walk away with that understanding, that, that's a huge revelation maybe for some of us today, that this spiritual warfare, is, it's all a battle of our minds about thinking rightly. And so if that's the battle, what do we need to do about it? We need to have a strong mind. And the way we have a strong mind is by guarding our thoughts and our minds. And that's what Paul goes on to write in this next section, starting in verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, 
Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Friends, if you grew up in the church, this is a familiar passage. You might have done a coloring page with a a soldier and all of his armor and a sword and so forth. Or, or maybe you've done different activities around the armor of God before. There's even like a Bible study called the armor of God that I think one of our groups did in the past year. And, but what we see from this is it's all about the mind. A guarded mind is a strong mind. And what this picture is giving us is there's weapons and there's defensive weapons mostly, but one offensive weapon that we'll talk about that help us to guard our mind. It's really practical. And so, yeah, Paul is talking seriously in this imagery about, you know, protecting ourselves. you know, putting on a belt of truth and a shield of faith. And there's this picture um, that we have. Now, the only thing is for many of us that have been raised in the church, I don't think we've been served well because we've been given this picture, literally the color in of one soldier. And we think as Christians, like, okay, I just need to fight the enemy. I need to, you know, put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the sword of the spirit. And I'm going to go to town, you know, fighting against this enemy who doesn't want me to love Jesus, follow Jesus and share Jesus with other people. And what we need to remember in this book of the Bible that we're reading is Paul, who's the author of the book, wrote to a church. He wrote to a group of people. They weren't Americans who have been groomed on individualism and, you know, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. They were people that were living in community together. And something that's really unfortunate is I think we've read this passage, for those of us who have read it before and been taught it before, very individually. And the passage isn't meant to be individual at all. It's meant to be, first of all, active. And so when you think about armor, you think about a noun, things you put on. But the reality is this armor is active. You know, faith, truth, righteousness, they're action words. They're just not like things that we, you know, like happen to us or that we're passive in. And then we, we walk these things out together. I think a much better picture for coloring pages would be a bunch of people standing together, arm in arm, ready to resist Satan together. Because what's really important about this passage is it's meant to be lived out in community, not on your own. We need the help of one another. And so when it says, you know, the, when it talks about, the, let's go through some of these uh, weapons or defensive weapons, the belt of truth, um, it's not just us like being armed with truth. It's us being surrounded by people that are going to speak truth to us. This just happened in a relationship and a friend that I have who was getting down on himself and saying, I just need to think better thoughts about myself. And I was actually like, you don't need to think better thoughts about yourself. You actually need to have God's thoughts about yourself. They're going to be much more powerful than your own thoughts for yourself. And I quoted a verse to him and it was a helpful moment where like, oh my goodness, God's words, the, the truth. I need to speak the truth you know, we need to speak the truth to one another. It happens in community. When you think of the breastplate of righteousness, you know, it's this individual picture. We always think like, I just need to be holy and set apart and righteous. And we, we view this individually when maybe God's original intention of writing about this is in a church community. Maybe we're just supposed to act rightly to each other. Maybe we're supposed to be kind to one another. Instead of seeing each other as the enemy, remember the spiritual warfare is like we're not each other's enemy in church or in families or in coworkers and so forth. Maybe what is fighting spiritual warfare is just being a kind, righteous person to other people. Are you acting rightly to other followers of Jesus? Are you being a pain in the butt to them? Because you know what? You're opening up the church and your life and the lives of those around you if you're being a pain in the butt to people around you, if you're not living rightly with other people, and then he goes on to talk about your feet with the gospel of peace. If you're not being a peacemaker and building bridges with others, but you regularly are picking fights and arguments and critiquing and criticizing, and nobody's good enough for you, you are actually being a weapon of Satan. And I know that sounds so strong and harsh, but that's the reality of this, you know, defensive weapons that we have is God just says please live at peace with each other the best way you can fight a spiritual battle is by putting on shoes that you bring peace to your workplace you bring peace to your family you bring 
peace to your neighbors wherever you go? Or would people say, man, they're stirring up drama. They're creating division. Who's using you in that moment? The enemy. He's actually using you as a tool for what he wants to do. These weapons are meant to be lived out in community and when community gets ripped apart, that's where Satan loves to jump in and mess things up, mess people's lives up, help people get off track with Jesus Christ. And then he ends with this last weapon, uh, the shield of faith. And uh, the shield of faith, if you've ever colored it in before in one of those pages, is always like this metal or iron shield. It's actually a leather shield. Um, and the Romans would, would have a leather shield and they would uh, put it in water and have a wet leather shield as they went to battle. So when a fiery dart would come, the wetness and the moisture of the shield would extinguish the fire. And faith is the action word our faith in God and our trust in him and as we faithfully live out the mission of God together, we're putting out fiery darts together. You know, faith is an action verb and so instead of just huddling up on Sunday mornings, which we've been talking about in this series and just saying, hey, let's help each other have faith in this moment, what if we courageously go and share our faith with others? That is the shield of faith working in our lives. Now, all so far, th these are just defensive weapons that we're pointing out in this passage. Um, but remember, they're weapons to protect our thinking, to guard our thoughts. You know, what causes us to not put on the belt of truth is to believe lies, to believe lies about what other people think about us, what God thinks about us. What causes us not to act rightly towards one another is maybe thinking the worst about somebody or to not forgive somebody else. You know, and we have weapons to be able to forgive, to be able to um, think the best about other people. Do you ever have a conversation in your mind with somebody? Maybe you walked away and you were like, ah, you, you just felt a tension or the conversation didn't go right and you start having a conversation in your mind. Like I think that's probably one of the moments in all of our lives, because that happens with all of us, that Satan loves to get involved the most because we get the upper hand, we show the person that we're right, and again, we start to get into this pattern of seeing it's us against them. It's me against my boss. It, it's me against my parent or my siblings. And Satan loves that. He absolutely loves it when you think the enemy is a flesh and blood person. The enemy is not a flesh and blood person. When you start to have those conversations in your mind, be aware. And beware that the enemy is close by and he wants you to view that person as an enemy. He wants to be, bring division between you and them. And this is where the battle is. Spiritual warfare, my friends, is not complicated. It's a battle in your mind. And so my question is, are you thinking rightly about God, about people, and are you bringing God's rules and his word to your mind in those moments. You know, as a pastor, a father, and a husband, so those are three titles that I have, all three of those titles, I'm in the position where I make decisions for other people. And you know what? You better believe people don't like my decisions in all three of those areas. You know, like, hey, let's come together, gather, and you know what? We're gonna wear masks. Boom. Who would ever thought masks and church would be one of the most divisive issues of our day? But it is, and people are angry about wearing masks or not wearing masks and freaking out one way or the other. And I have to make a decision one way or another. And the enemy would love for you to stop coming to church because of a stupid mask. Who is winning, my friends? It's not a me against you decision or an us against them. As I make decisions about being a father and I tell my kids, I don't want you to go to this environment. I don't think it's, I don't think it's healthy for you. Um, I, I want you to be safe and rather I'd have, have you be a part of this environment. Sometimes my kids might not like the decisions that I make, but it's not me against them making decisions for their good. And the enemy would love for us to just live our lives thinking that we live in a flesh and blood war with one another instead of a spiritual war where he wants to mess up all these relationships. And friends, here's the thing. God gives us one critical, critical, I've already accidentally said it, weapon uh, for us to fight because it's not just defensive weapons that we have, but we have offensive weapons too. And so the illustration goes on with this final 
weapon, calling it the sword of the spirit. And in case Paul like is worried that his audience is getting lost in translation, because he's giving them an analogy, but his analogy has real handles to it. He says, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, meaning the Bible. If you weren't sure what the sword of the spirit is, it's the Bible. And so if you go into a shootout without a gun, you're going to lose. If you go into a fencing match without a sword, you're going to lose. You might have the best defensive strategy, but if you don't have one offensive weapon, because he only gives us one, you will lose. You need the word of God. If you try to bring the fullness of Jesus to any place and space of your world, whether it's just your personal walk with God, your marriage, your friends, your coworkers, anybody, without having the word of God fill your mind, remember this is a battle in our mind, you're going to lose. You're not going to win. And the sword of the spirit is your weapon. And if you don't open your Bible, you are fighting without a weapon. Friends, don't do that. Open the Bible. Get the Bible in you. Get it in you so much that some of the writers of scripture say, if I hid your word in my heart, it's, it's in their mind so much that it goes into their heart and it affects their emotions and their full being. We need to have God's words in our minds so that we can think rightly about God so that we know right away when the enemy's talking to us. So we know right away the enemy's trying to mess up my marriage by think, having me think the worst about my wife right now. You know, that's not true. I'm not gonna believe it. And if it is true, I'm gonna ask my wife and have an honest conversation with her or whoever that relationship might be for you. Friends, don't go into battle without a weapon. You know, the most epic battle that I mentioned, Jesus and Satan, what does Jesus do in all three of those temptations? He quotes the Bible. He had the Bible in his mind and it what, it's what guarded his mind and it put him on the offensive. And what happens when we go on the offensive in this spiritual warfare concept? Satan runs. Satan ran away from Jesus after Jesus quoted three Bible verses. Do you think you can quote three Bible verses to Satan? If you can, you're going to have the enemy run away. You don't just have to be on the defense, but you can have this spiritual warfare be totally dialed down by applying these things, by having God's word in you. And then Paul goes on, I don't know if he ran out of like illustrations with the armor of God thing, but he does talk about prayer. And there's just no weapon for prayer, but he does say pray fervently, pray about your situation. It's another offensive weapon, I think. And as a church, we need to be praying. You need to be praying. We need to be connecting with God through prayer as well. And so I would say that's another offensive weapon that Paul just doesn't have some metaphor for. But when we go back to the Acts 2 church, we just went through the book of Acts earlier this year. What did they do really well? It's what we're talking about this morning. They prayed together really well. They taught and talked about the word of God really well. And they did that in community. Spiritual warfare is about in community, speaking the truth, the word of God together, about praying with one another. And when the Acts 2 church and the church of Acts did that well, the mission of God went forward fiercely and aggressively just because of a couple key things that they did that I would say is spiritual warfare. And Paul reminds us in this passage that you and I need to know our, our, our war is not against flesh and blood. It's not about a committee meeting. You know, it's not about arguments that we can have in the church about paint on the walls or doing group this way or that way. You know, sometimes like we didn't even talk about prayer and maybe we have prayer meetings. You just don't even like the prayer meeting. It's kind of like, I don't want to pray this way. And it's like, oh my goodness, the enemy loves to just get in and screw us up because we don't like to pray or sing the same way. And so he is trying to get, you know, his foot in any opportunity he can. I just want to implore you, don't be used by the enemy. If people in your group want to pray together and you don't like the way they're praying, don't be Satan's tool to divide your group. You know, if, if you don't like, you know, wearing masks or not wearing masks to church, don't be a tool of the enemy. You Be used by God to bring unity. Come on, church. Let's unite together. And let's not give in in this war to Satan. It's really simple. Because when we see each other as the enemy, when we don't like decisions, when we don't, when we're critical of the, certain things, the, the real enemy, Satan, he's winning. And I don't want him to win. I want you to win. More importantly, I want Jesus to win. I want his fullness to go into the world. And the way that we do it is living out what we're talking about. 
is living out a way to put on the armor of God, to be united together, standing together, fulfilling the mission of God. This isn't an armor just for you as an individual. It's an armor that we share with one another. So jump in a group, live in community, have other people that are like-minded in pursuing Jesus Christ, speaking the truth in love, living rightly and faithfully, and sharing God's word in love with you. So church, it's a pretty clear message as we wrap up. If you want to be made for more and bring the fullness of Jesus, realize there's a war. And realize that who the enemy is and make sure you have a battle plan based on the armor of God. It's all taking place in your mind. Guard your mind. When you have a guarded mind, you'll have a strong mind. When you have a strong mind, you'll bring the fullness of Jesus into the world. All right, friends. Well, while we're closing out this Made for More series, it's really not the end of anything. It's the beginning of just continuing to press into being the church that God has called us to be, to bring the fullness of Jesus to the people and the places that we've been called. And so, as Tim said, the enemy hates that. He doesn't like that. So I just want to encourage you, um, press in, uh, take time, uh, spend time with God. Uh, in his word, pray with one another, um, and just be encouraged by other followers of Jesus around you. Don't do that alone, and then go out and spread the gospel and take the good news of Jesus everywhere. And so um, just as a reminder, there's a really practical way that we can all do that together corporately as a church um, next week in our small groups as we're going to be going out for Surf Fest and serving our community. So if you haven't already signed up, again, make a note of that on your check-in form. Uh, and we can't wait to see you uh, out there next week serving. Again, we won't be here, but we'll be back uh, next week um, together online and at Hannah Moore. So hope to see you then.